study cannot be judged by now. You, know, you have to look five years from now. And when you have other courses, so it rings a bell. And then see what you got out of it. I try to do it, I mean, really deep. I mean, but take into account that we don't have a background. Uh, and take into account that we have only 12 weeks and we cannot cover everything. I mean, we have to really, I mean, more tempt you into the subject and expose you, I mean, to, to the basic. And then uh, be rational and, uh, uh, and with the expectation in the exam and in the essay and in general in tutorial and so on. So, uh, so I know that it's challenging and I know that you feel sometimes frustrated because you don't understand certain things, but I think that it's more responsible because that's the situation really. You know, if, if I gave you the impression that you understand everything, I wouldn't do a good job. Because these things are very difficult. For instance, the problem of induction, professional philosophers nowadays still are struggling with this problem. So it means that it's a difficult problem. Zeno paradoxes, Zeno's paradoxes survived for 2,500 years. You know, and, and some people think that still they don't have good solutions. So it means that they're done. Uh, there is no way around. I mean, it's, it's fooling. I mean, if it, what makes it kind of everything is clear and, and fine, it would be superficial, but in my view, you might learn, might learn with the, the wrong things about the subject. So, so that's the choice, I mean, and, and it's more demanding, more difficult. But the point is, and that's an important thing, I think, in philosophy in general, in studying uh, academic, and in studying in general, that one cannot understand everything. And it's fine. It's fine. It's not a measure. If you don't understand everything that is not explained well, or it wasn't a good course, uh, because that's normal. I have it every day with many, many years of philosophy. I still struggle when I see something new, and I struggle when I see something that I'm supposed to be expert. I mean, it's normal. It's not, it just means that it's, it's difficult. Philosophy, I mean, and thinking about ideas in general, especially if these ideas are complicated and more advanced than they So, so, <coughs> So that's, uh, that's the choice. Also, uh, the structure of the course, uh, let me try to explain again. I mean, there, there is, there is a, a there is, the structure is not, is not arbitrary. There is one, one aspect is going from, you know, antiquity covering, I mean, uh, relatively a long period. So going from ancient Greece, which is the basis of more, of a lot of Western thinking and science has been very much uh, influenced by Western thinking. You know, if you may think that it's not a good thing, but that's the reality. Uh, so we started from Zeno, and we talked about metaphysics. So we talked about Zeno space and time. We talked about, we, we, we tried to see how these, uh, these ancient ideas influenced or were related to modern thinking about space time. So there was a kind of metaphysics. Then we move to talk about metaphysics in space and time in the early modern Leibniz and Newton, but also looking at religion, which is an important influence on metaphysics, something that is lacking these days, but has been very influential in the development of thoughts. Then we talked about uh, we talked about how the, the period in which uh, a lot of the aspects of modern science were developed. That's the reason why we talk about natural magic and some other things that we talk about how mathematics became prominent and how the experimental uh, method became uh, important. And now, talking about the card and, and, and the you is part of this scientific revolution. He's talking about how the concept of knowledge has changed. You and the, the card and you are two of the main prominent people who actually shape the view of knowledge especially scientific knowledge uh, that we have nowadays, I mean, of, and, and generally of modern science. So obviously it need not be the same, but this was, these two things are very important in that sense. And then we talk about Popper and Kuhn, which is the 20th 
20th century. And, and as you can see from the reading that you see today, that Popper was influenced by you. Popper's philosophy of science is a reaction <coughs> to Hume's problem of induction. So it's, it's a direct reaction, I mean, to, to it. Uh, so there is, a, and as we shall see, Kuhn is a kind of revolution and also taking into account, I mean, what happens up to him, I mean, in doing history of science, the philosophy of science, and basically reacted to that by providing, by proposing, I mean, a different uh, outlook at the history of science and philosophy of science. So that's the structure, I mean, uh, obviously it's kind of weak and overwhelming sometimes, uh, but again, it's more to expose you to the ideas, so you know when you take other courses, it's actually a specific introduction to philosophy of science that more focus on some of the issues in the course, there is a HPS 350, which is a small seminar in which one goes from Kuhn and look at Kuhn. I mean, oh, in detail, Kuhn is, is not an easy writer, and we will only talk about one chapter of his book, but we look at the whole book, and then look at uh, some other uh, more recent, I mean, writing that were influenced by Kuhn, and, and, and look at all the sociological and cultural influence and science and so on. And there are some other courses, I mean, also, I mean, that you can take that emphasize some of the things. History of medicine, for instance, so we talked about how the Papa Ascensions, for instance, talk about medicine and some other. So you can have a chance to look how this developed from continuity to the 20th century in more detail. Uh, there is a course on the scientific revolution and, and there are a number of other courses that uh, really focus and, and develop, I mean, one meeting maybe or two meetings, I mean, into a whole course or sometimes the whole year. So if you are interested, I highly recommend, I mean, if you have the time and the capacity to take these courses, I mean, they definitely a natural and good way to continue. So that's, that was a long spiel, I mean, but uh, uh, just to, I mean, kind of, uh, I know that sometimes in the detail, I mean, one can be lost and overwhelmed. Uh, any questions? Any proposals, I mean, suggestions on something that we can do better? In addition to what you propose, I mean, we can use words and we will look kind of detail and try to do the best. As I said, I mean, we cannot always, I mean, uh, satisfy everybody because it's a bit less. And that is not the Okay, so back to you. Uh, so we have to finish you today to do Popper. Uh, so just to remind you, we talked about the problem of uh, induction. So you, in a sense, challenges the card uh, by actually posing a problem for all knowledge, the, the problem of induction. The card tries to justify knowledge based on certain foundation, and Jung seems to suggest that the problem of the induction demonstrate that this is impossible. That we cannot justify all our beliefs by reason. That's what Descartes tried to do. Descartes' meditation is by reason. He sits, he sits in his chair and meditates and try to find out by thought, by reason, what would be the certain foundation on the basis of which he can justify all his knowledge. It's not that the cult we really think that everything he knows is false. That's not. But he's bothered by the fact that uh, people did not justify enough the knowledge uh, uh, that, that there is at this time. So he wants to come up with a project that we show that this knowledge of most of it is just. And the, the, the problem of induction <coughs> has shaped, I mean, the uh, scientific, the, the, the subject of scientific, scientific knowledge because it's so difficult to justify. So it shows that uh, Descartes' project is much more problematic than Descartes seems to suggest. Um, so, so the problem, just to remind you, is that it seems that you cannot justify uh, 
induction just by reason, by inductive reasoning. Um, on the other hand, justifying induction by inductive reasoning would be circular or would lead to infinite regress. You always use another inductive reasoning to justify the previous one. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be satisfactory and philosophers don't, most philosophers, if not all, find it, I mean, unsatisfactory. So your solution is to say that induction is not justified by reason. So let's say conclusion, it's very important. It means that the CARDS project is not started for you. You cannot do what the CARDS wants to do because induction is the basis of most of our knowledge about the world. Um, and this knowledge cannot be justified by reason for you. So let's see your own solution. Um, one thing that is really important and what I try to teach you is difficult about you because most of the people including Popper, if you write Popper, what he says about the problem of induction, uh, I don't think he got you right. And Popper was one of the leading philosophers of the past. He thinks that Jung's solution is just psychology. Jung says that there is a custom and habit, and you know, that's our custom and habit, uh, and that justifies induction. So that's our nature, and that just, but that's obviously, I mean, not, not good enough. Uh, Jung doesn't say that. Jung bases his solution on the psychological nature and the, the human nature. Uh, but it's not the solution to say that it, that's it, you know. But, you know, take it or leave it. I mean, that's, that, that, that's it and, and that's what we are. And it's unfortunate, maybe. But there is nothing else to do. But we see that there is also suggested that that might be one of the solutions but it's actually not the strongest one. Hume has a different solution uh, that is kind of more difficult, tricky, and, and, and it's a lot of philosophy. So let's see. Uh, in order to understand the solution, we have to understand what are the foundation of knowledge and thinking in general for you. And you, just to remind you, I mean, that's uh, what we did last time, uh, Hume says that all reasoning concerning matter of facts, meaning about the world, something that is not a priori, no, uh, not logic or something like that, uh, seems to be found on the relation of cause and effect. So it means that we have an idea of cause and we have an idea of effect and they are connected. Because we take cause and effect to be connected, not arbitrarily, not contingently, but necessarily. Because Bring about effort. So by means of this relation, we said alone, we can go beyond the evidence of the memory. We see a collision and our mind actually jumps to, to the idea of reflection. It's not even clear that we see the reflection before the mind jumps to the idea of reflection. So that's where it's the, there is the idea that collision and reflection are connected necessarily. And he says that all reasoning concerning facts, so all induction, are of the same nature. It is constantly supposed that there is a, a connection between the present and that which is inferred from it. So you see a collision, and uh, the mind jumps to the idea of inflection. And does it actually automatically? It's not I mean, something that uh, it's, you can decide. And now I'm not going to see inflection. I mean, I studied philosophy. I want to be skeptical. I'm not going to see it. It's not for you, I mean, yeah. It's not, I mean, you know that you cannot do that. Um, so that's the point that you make. I mean, you can do as much philosophy as you like. You might be still jump, I mean, to the idea of inflection. Because this is a necessary connection that is wired in the mind. Not talking about the brain, it's, it's in the mind, whatever the mind, whether the mind is the brain or not, whatever your view about the relationship between the brain and the mind, these ideas are wired in the mind. Okay? And they are created by experience. Um, and he says that where there's nothing to bind them together, 
the inference would be entirely precarious. If the mind didn't bind them together, there would be no connection between collision and deflection because one doesn't logically imply the other. There is no conceptual relation between the two unless you have this idea that one is the cause of the other. You cannot just come to the world, tabula rasa, without you know, any idea in the mind, like the card wants to do, and suddenly infer that collision, I mean, is related to deflection. You need experience for this. Without experience, everything could be connected to everything, which means that it's all meaningless, basically. You cannot make a distinction between what is relevant and what is not, and there is no thinking. It's not just induction that you cannot, there is no thinking. It, it's chaos, basically. So, he says, we would not be able to relate well, so in this case, key to flame or collision to or force of deflection. Uh, so that's the, that's what actually allows us to see what is relevant to what and what is connected to what. And what is plausible and what is not. Uh, so you cannot decide reason and plausibility by pure thinking. You really need the experience in order to have content this idea of possibility and well. But then he says, causes and effects are discovery, discovered not by reason, but by experience. Okay, that's what we said. Our ideas of cause and effect are produced automatically when we expose to experience. So the basis of induction is automatic wiring of the mind. It's not something that we ever considered whether it's good or bad. It's not negotiable. It just happened to you. Okay? It's like we cannot decide whether we can fly or not. We cannot fly. There is a gravity. We don't have wings. That's part of our nature. It's not a decision. Well, maybe it's unfortunate, but that's the case. The same is with the mind. For the basic elements of thinking is the same. Okay? So the basis what reason is not reason is experience. How the experience actually influences automatically the mind. So Suddenly the mind come up 
there is a wire. This is connected to that. This is strongly connected, this is less, and so on. Uh, so the, when the mind, for instance, is exposed to regularity of collision and, and deflection, suddenly, uh, involuntary, we have the idea that there is a connection between it. You cannot just see it once and come up with the idea because it's like a baby, you know, a baby doesn't know that something is related. See, collision and deflection do not connect between the two. You need a repetition, and what the repetition does, it creates, I mean, this connection in the mind. Okay, so you have a collision and deflection, we see it many times, and you don't have to see just collision and deflection, we see a lot of collisions or something similar to collision in, in reality. So when we see the collision and deflection of the, of the billiard balls, it's already after we have been exposed to many, many other experiences that are similar. So if we see it for the first time and we are not surprised, it's not by chance, because we are already being indoctrinated by nature. 